Okay, so hi everyone. Um, it's just about three o'clock now, so we'll go ahead and get started. So nice to um, to see you all here today. I think I know um, almost everybody, um, but if I don't know you, I'm Shannon Egan. I am the director of Schmucker Art Gallery, and um, welcome to Family Weekend at Gettys for College 2020. Um, it is a little bit, um, yeah, obviously a little bit different than than how we normally uh, approach our programming for Family Weekend, but I am thrilled that um, that Schmucker Art Gallery is is able to to be involved and that we are all here together um, and can kind of virtually walk through the the exhibition that's currently up at Schmucker Art Gallery. So um, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to share my PowerPoint and show you um, some of the installation shots, but this is really an opportunity for uh, for my students to to tell you a bit about their their research from last year. So just a little bit about the show. I am going to um, again share my screen right now. Um, so hopefully everybody can see this. So today we're going to be talking about um, I Beseech You, Women, Art, Politics, and Power. And this is an exhibition, again, that's currently up in the gallery. And if you are a uh, current Gettysburg College student, staff, or faculty, um, you are welcome to, to come in and see the show um, now through November 20th. So the, um, the idea for the exhibition really started about a year or so ago. And I was teaching a class in the fall called Art and Public Policy. And the students in that class were tasked with choosing a work from, um, from our collection and thinking about how that work intersects with, with public policy, with, with politics, and obviously with power. The, um, the exhibition was intended to coincide with the 100th um, anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, which ostensibly guaranteed um, and protected women's constitutional right to vote. But of course, as, as we should all know, the 19th Amendment didn't guarantee all women's right to vote. And so, um, so this exhibition kind of sets, sets the stage for discussing continued issues of inequality and social justice. And all of the artwork in the exhibition are all uh, by women artists who respond to issues of identity, environmental activism, politics, and power and art. The students in my spring semester class, Art After 1945, kind of picked up um, where the students in the fall left off and were also tasked with uh, choosing a work of art um, uh, from a contemporary work of art and also to think about um, to think about these relevant issues. Um, as we all know, um, in March, uh, everybody went home. We've switched to remote learning. And so I am um, especially proud of my students in the spring for kind of for keeping up and continuing with their research and writing during a really difficult semester. I also want to thank um, a few students who decided to, to pick up extra work and continued uh, researching and writing about additional uh, works of art through the summer. I want to acknowledge to um, the generous donors and lenders uh, to the exhibition as well well as the, the co-sponsors. So the co-sponsors of the exhibition um, are the Department of Africana Studies, art, the Art and Art History Department, Peace and Justice Studies, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Environmental Studies, the Office of Multicultural Engagement, and the Women's and LGBTQIA Resource Center. Um, I also mentioned, yeah, I want to thank the, the generous donors and loaners, loaner, loan, uh, lenders to the exhibition, um, Dr. Deborah Smith, who I think is joining us today, uh, the Robin Wagner and Michael Berkner Acquisition Fund, as well as Lafayette College Art Galleries, Dickinson College's Trout Gallery, and the Colby College Museum of Art, as well as artist Jessica Houston. So, um, so what I want to do next is um, is have my my students um, introduce themselves, um, and I also would love for um, for Carolyn if you want to introduce yourself too, that would be that'd be fantastic. And if you want to 
jump in and I'll kind of mention your involvement in a minute, but maybe we can start with Megan and you can um, tell us your, you know, your class year, your major, um, and um, and which which work of art you discussed. And then um, after we do some introductions, then we'll, again, we'll sort of walk through the gallery and each of you will have a chance to, to talk about, talk a little bit about um, the work of art that you researched. So, so yeah, I'll start with Megan. Hi, my name is Megan Reimer. I am currently a junior art history major and I was fortunate enough to be able to research um, the photographs by Donna Ferrato from her series, Living with the Enemy. Thanks. Okay, uh, Darby, it's so nice to see you again. Hi everyone, I'm Darby. Uh, I graduated in May. I'm currently uh, working on my MLIS degree and I research K Walking Stick and Suco. Thanks. Okay, Ashley. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a senior. Um, I'm an art history major, and I was able to research Zoe Charlton's Home Bodies Number Eight and Reared Number Two. Great, thanks. Okay, and then, like I said, I want to mention Carolyn Hawk. Um, she uh, she gave an amazing gallery talk. Um, earlier this semester, she was one of our two student curators for the exhibition Mexico and the People, uh, Revolutionary Printmaking in the Taller de Grafica Popular. Um, and Carolyn is on campus this semester and she's also been giving in-person gallery tours. So if you have the opportunity to be, I don't know if any of us um, have the opportunity to be on campus, but she's been giving um, some in-person gallery tours um, on the I Beseech You exhibition. So Carolyn, you wanna um, pop in and say hi to everybody? <laughs> hi, yeah, I, I apologize. My camera's not necessarily working today. Um, yeah, this summer I've, um, and actually last semester, I had the pleasure of researching six of the 12 lithographs that are currently on display in the gallery that were created by the Tellier de Grafica Popular in 1946 for the Associated American Artist Gallery in New York City. Great, yes. And if we have a little bit of time um, at the end, maybe we can, um, we can, I'll, I'll, I'll switch PowerPoints and we can, we can walk through that space as well. Um, as I mentioned to, to the students earlier, I kind of intend for this to be um, a pretty informal discussion. We're a relatively small, intimate group. So, um, so let's, let's just sort of chat and, um, and, and talk a bit about the work. So don't hesitate to, yeah, um, unmute yourselves, shout out, um, and we can, we can pretend that we are all in the space uh, looking at art and having a conversation. And it is so nice to see um, Emily Francisco here. Hi, Emily. She gave a wonderful, wonderful talk. She's Gettysburg College, class of 2014, who is cura uh, currently a curatorial uh, assistant at the National Gallery of Art and gave a fantastic lecture on Wednesday evening. So again, Emily, please do uh, jump in and um, and lend us your, your expertise as we go through. So if you haven't had a chance to come into the gallery, um, this, is, this is what you would see um, as you kind of enter into the space. Um, I always have a fun time selecting uh, wall colors. And um, this year I wanted, because it was the exhibition was intended to coincide with um, with the centennial um, of the suffrage movement, I wanted to kind of obliquely nod to to those colors. A couple of the walls are tinted, kind of a slight, slight purple. Um, and um, and as you can see too, um, yeah, a, a big mix of prints and collages, um, some sculpture, and then in the back we we have um, a video installation. The um, title of the exhibition is borrowed uh, from this print by a prominent black woman artist named Carrie Mae Weems titled, Tell Me, I Beseech You, When I Casted My Vote to You, Did I Cast It to the Wind? Um, and unfortunately, Ryan um, DeStefano, who wrote about this work in the art and public policy class is, is, not, is not here to tell us about his research, but I thought it was a really kind of important and timely 
um, work to, to include in the show. This was a work that we uh, acquired a couple of years ago. Uh, the purchase was made possible by um, the Michael Berkner, Robin Wagner, Art and Photography Acquisition Fund, um, with additional support by from Dr. Deborah Smith. And Dr. Smith and I had a wonderful time, uh, exciting time um, bidding on this at auction a few years ago. So it's really exciting to, to have a work by Carrie Mae Weems in our collection. So, um, so just as I mentioned, the title of the exhibition is borrowed from this print. Um, I beseech you, and I think that this is to me. This is this is sort of again sets the tone for the entire exhibition, which is the artwork is pleading with us. The artists are pleading with us um, in in terms of trying to convey. Um, the the artwork as activism to try to convey a kind of political message and an urging for social action um, and in this case this work was um, created in conjunction with the Democratic National Convention in 1996. And I just wanna mention that I think Ryan did a really um, fantastic job in the, um, in the exhibition catalog. And for those of you who are not on campus, I'd be happy to, to mail you a copy, a hard copy of this exhibition catalog. Um, oh, hey, Ryan, there you are. I am going to turn it over to you so you can tell us a little bit about um, about how you situated uh, Carrie Mae Weems's work and, and um, yes, your, your general thoughts on it. So nice to see you. And if you could introduce yourself too, to the group. Uh, yeah, so um, I am Ryan DeStefano. I'm a senior at Gettysburg and I took the um, art and public policy class last year. Um, and yeah, so I did the write up on the Carrie Mae, Carrie Mae Weems work, which I thought was a very um, super, super interesting work. Um, I really liked the kind of combination of like the old um, 19th century uh, photograph with kind of the, the 20th century kind of political message. Um, and I think it uh, definitely is still a message that like kind of continues to, to resonate. Um, um, I think like, especially some events over the summer um, with, with uh, 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 like the Black Lives Matter movement or, or whatever else, I think that um, the idea of people asking like, did I, when I cast my vote too, did I cast the wind? I think that still um, has a lot of, a lot of power. Um, and yeah, and so yeah, going to write, writing about it, I, I um, really wanted to look uh, at, Carrie Mae Weems uh, was really trying to present her, uh, you know, uh, perspectives on like issues of power and systemic racism and institutional inequalities, um, and um, but both between the, the the kind of the political message and the um, artistic, um, you know, combination of the of the um, uh, what's his name, Gustave Legray's photo um, with uh, with uh, her her own words. I thought was very very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and we had an interesting, I feel like um, this was a while back, but Ryan and I, we had kind of interesting conversations, even around this use of like first person and second person. And in this one, this one question that she, that there's a kind of repetition of this first person, like tell me, I beseech you, when I cast in my vote to you, did I cast it to the wind? And again, the repetition of I, the repetition of, you know, of, of you know, me and my, and then also of, of you and um, yeah, and I agree, Ryan, that it has a um, it takes on particular relevance right now in the midst of this, you know, very very um, fraught um, election. And yeah, and as Ryan mentioned, uh, this is her text, and she appropriates an, a nineteenth century photograph. Uh, by the French photographer Gustave Le Gray. And I've gotten a few questions from, um, from students as I've done, you know, class tours is that she, um, she was the one who tinted it, who tinted it purple, that the original photograph would have been, you know, maybe about this big, um, black and white. Um, but also it sort of looks, um, it looks really lovely against the, the, the purple walls. So in addition to, you know, borrowing the title of the exhibition from this print, I also borrowed that that beautiful kind of lavender tint. Any questions? I want to kind of yeah keep keep the sort of conversational. So any questions for Ryan? For so me? Shannon, this is uh, Deborah. 
Good okay. afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deborah Smith and uh, a parent of two Gettysburg grads and the person that um, Shannon referred to a couple of times, thank you very much as having been involved um, with some of the pieces here. So thank you for your comments, Ryan. I would just sort of um, echo back when you made the comment about we had such a great time and, and we have had great times at um, mm -hmm. auctions, both in person and now we've been relegated to online. But, um, and I distinctly remember where this was hanging in the um, Swan Gallery in New York up over in a corner. And we were sort of almost mm -hmm. hoping that nobody would see it besides us. But of course, <laughs> everybody would have been seeing a Carrie Mae Weems um, photograph at that point in time. But I think it was in the run up to the 2016 election. And so it's mm -hmm. not that we that it was acquired. So it's not just that it it is still is timely now, um, but that was actually part of our embracing it at the time. Even and the thought clearly was that we might have our first um, female president that that um, mm -hmm. election cycle. But there was still a lot of controversies about um, you know that candidacy brought up a lot of controversies about women and also um, you know, women in politics and women in, in public life, as well as um, uh, issues related to um, African-Americans and race and social justice. I think it's interesting because as I mentioned, you know, sort of Carrie Mae Weems is, is, uh, is her star has been rising for a long time and it's really fairly um, well established in the in the firmament, but it's also really interesting to think about her um, really engaging in this work all the way back in 1996 when hardly anybody <laughs> as as uh, knew her in the same sense that that we now know her, and um, we're exactly the same age, so um, it's really very interesting to. Um, Kind of think of the way in which the art, this this piece and her work and her thoughts, have sort of gone through these cycles, and that we are we can still embrace it now. So it's great to see it. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting too when in Ryan's research he did a fabulous fabulous job putting it in the you know kind of political and now historical context of the 1990s and discussed um, the, the Clarence Thomas Supreme Court hearings and, um, and uh, Anita Hill. And that's been really interesting too, as I've been leading classes through, through the gallery, kind of both physically and virtually, is using, using that controversy um, to, to discuss sort of more recent, also very contentious Supreme Court nominations too. So um, Ryan, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was actually, I, I was when I was looking back through my, I just uh, thought that was yeah. the, uh, uh, um, yeah, obviously, like the, uh, yeah, it was a, it was part, partly in response to the Clarence to the Clarence Thomas hearings, um, and um, I think when um, we were writing this, it was just after or just around the, the the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and now we're in the Amy Coney Barrett hearings process, mm -hmm. and so it's just, uh, and with the you know with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently, like I think the the issues of um, uh, like women's rights and the feminist movement, um, which she also touches on um, in her in her work, um, you know, they're all they're all, they're all kind of thrust back into the into the national conversation. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just think that's a it's it's sort of a, a um, like kind of a common a common thread throughout our history um, from way back to now that um, uh, it's interesting to see it how how this commentary could you could almost apply it to any time period. But uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks. So we'll just kind of keep keeping. I'm keeping an eye on the time. I'm not going to keep anybody past four o'clock, but um, want to keep us moving through. So the um, the Carrie Mae Weems work is installed um, on this wall. Um, these are the doors as you enter into the gallery, 
And, um, and it's a relatively eclectic show. As I mentioned, it's all kind of centered, you know, all of the artists are women artists. The theme of the exhibition is, um, is about, you know, how these different women artists take on various issues. Um, but I like when, I, when I'm thinking about exhibition design, I like for there to be at least some kind of thread that connects just like formally, you know, thematically that connects one work to another work. And on this wall, um, this is the, the Carrie Mae Williams print, that it's about kind of reflecting back, kind of appropriating or um, paying homage or um, working with, um, you know, work of art from, you know, from the previous century. So she appropriates this 19th century photographs and then the text is what is important, right? The text um, changes the meaning and changes the message of, of that, you know, 19th century Gustave Le Grey photograph from just a, you know, a boat on the water into something that is engaging um, very significantly with, with the politics of the period. So right next to that is another work. Uh, this is by artist Sue Ko um, called Butcher. And, and again, she is also looking backwards, paying, you know, thinking um, about uh, art historical precedents uh, juxtaposing that with a big, um, with, with text. And, um, and I'll just want to mention too, uh, that next to, uh, next to Sue Coe's work, and Darby's going to tell us a little bit more about Sue Coe, are two prints by Kata Kolwitz. And Kata Kolwitz um, was a major influence on, on Sue Coe. So I feel like these, these are the, the strings and the threads that, that hold it together. And Darby, I wish you could see, I wish you could see this in, in person. So, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth. These are the two Kata Kowitz prints, and again, as Darby is is talking about Suko, I want you all to kind of keep um, again keep keep these prints in mind in thinking about how um, how we can understand them in relationship to to Suko. So, Prisoners on the left, 1908, which is an etching, and then the Parents on the right, which is a woodblock print. And so, yeah, so go ahead, Darby, tell us a little bit about what you learned, who Suko is, that, that sort of thing. Um, so Suko is an English artist. Um, she grew up next to a slaughterhouse, uh, which was very influential into uh, the type of content and subject matter that she was interested in creating later. Um, initially, she worked at the Times, but ultimately that was too restricting for her. She wanted uh, bigger canvases, both liter literally uh, and metaphorically. And so uh, she left the Times and started doing more of her own independent work. And a lot of her themes are about racial prejudice. Um, she's done things about the KKK, urban violence, and advocacy for women's rights. Um, and then this print and many others are about uh, meat consumption and uh, like the meat industry. So this one is um, a lot about the treatment of animals at slaughterhouses. Um, when she grew up next to a slaughterhouse, um, she witnessed an animal trying to escape and how they caught it and had to bring it back and just the really harsh treatment of the animals, how inhumanely they were treated and um, not respected with their lives. So that's basically the main theme of this, um, just the really harsh reality of mass meat consumption and, and how humans have such little regard for uh, the process of meat consumption, meat consumption and slaughterhouses um, and really the ethics that go on behind it. Um, Professor Egan, I remember you saying your husband stopped eating meat after researching her, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this, I like to mention that because, um, because back to the idea of I beseech you that, that Suko is definitely an artist who is like beseeching us, right? Pleading with us, um, begging us to kind of re reconsider um, the, the, the ethics of, of eating meat. Um, and, and, uh, he was, you know, he was able to hear her give the gallery talk and saw a kind of a bigger, um, um, exhibition of her work at, at Dickinson College and the way that she kind of articulated, um, the, the issues that Darby just addressed, just, it, you, you know, just like a switch flipped for him and, um, and it clicked and, and, and to me, to me that, I mean, that's a, that is, that is what art should do. It should make you think, make you think differently about these issues. And I think all of the artists in the exhibition, again, are kind of, again, begging us 
to to think differently um, about these larger issues. Yeah, and I'll add one more thing. One of the things I appreciated about this and doing the research is that um, slaughterhouses aren't necessarily, you know, they don't want to invite cameras in and crews and to show really the reality of this. So when Sue Co was doing her research, she was able to bring in sketchbooks and notepads. And this was her way of saying, look, this is what's happening. I can't show you um, with cameras and pictures and things, but this is the reality of it. This is what I want you to know. So just, I think that's really important to remember the way artists are able to communicate about current events um, in ways that other people are unable to. Yeah. And just a little bit more about the, the behind the scenes of how this work got selected. Um, often with, with these, you know, student um, curated exhibitions where, you know, we're kind of limited to, to, you know, to what we have available in the collection or we're kind of, you know, limited in terms of, um, yeah, what, what the selection is, but uh, the Trout Gallery at Dickinson College kind of generously um, opened their doors to, to my class in the spring. And fortunately, this visit was, I think, in February, early February 2020. So back in the, the blissful days of normal times. Um, and so the students were able to see um, a selection of about, I think, like six or seven <clears throat> works by Suco that they have in their collection and really kind of discuss and assess and think about think about size and, and scale, um, as well as um, think about how it might fit with, with other works that would be included in the exhibition. And, and this is the one that they voted on um, and that they included. And so again, I was, I was really lucky to be able to, um, to have, you know, for the students to have that hands-on experience before the pandemic took hold. Um, I also want to mention, um, too, uh, again, her influences of uh, Kata Kolwitz um, in terms of like, and we are really lucky that that we can see these Kata Kolwitz prints. And when I have had other classes come in, one thing that we've, we've been discussing is this, is how artists, you know, use, um, you know, use their style, use their subject to convey this sense of anguish and pain and suffering. And what's interesting about these two prints is that they are from, you know, they're almost, you know, about 15, 20 years apart. Um, one made before the First World War, one before the First World War and the other after. Um, and again, different, different styles of printmaking. But we can see different displays of anguish too, and the the bodies of the prisoners kind of all squished and huddled together with their wrists bound, with you know different expressions of of pain and um, and this this little figure, this little boy in the immediate foreground, is always so heartbreaking to me with his head you know leaned over, his wrists bound and pressed against this rope um, that has all of these prisoners just you know stuck together and this reminds me of, of um, again just the understanding of slaughterhouses and the meat industry as Darby mentioned where you hear stories of you know chickens stuck together in cages too small or you know um, livestock or cows again um, massed and pressed together without any thought about their um, their well-being about about their you know sense of, of pain um, and um, as they're kind of carted, carted off to, to their, their death. Um, the one, the print on the right, uh, again, with, with, with class visits recently, we've been talking about which, which print conveys kind of more, uh, a greater sense of grief or evokes um, more, you know, more emotion and more sympathy from the viewer. And I'm just kind of curious, I always like to, to take a poll to ask, ask the group which one seems to convey more, more anguish or suffering. I, I would say the prisoners, but I also can't quite, I think if I saw them in person, it might be different. I just can't quite see the parents as well. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, I know it's all, that's, that's the unfortunate part. We were there in person, we could see each little, you know, stroke. Yeah, Ashley. Well, I was lucky enough to be a part of the class that did curate this work. So I have seen them both in person. And for me, it's always the parents that gets me. 
because like you can just see like in the etching just like just how deep their pain is almost of like losing their child and like you feel the grief of the prisoners and like their anguish of like facing their own mortality but I think it's almost even worse to be a parent thinking about your child's mortality yeah yeah and although you can't I mean and and, and what I've been kind of talking about with with some of the students is like is if if like you see the different faces right you see uh different expressions and different you know um ways that, that the faces are turned or or up or down and she's really kind of um uh, uh you know conveying these each very you know individually and distinctly and we don't see the faces at all here and yet we feel we kind of will we feel in our body is their their sense of grief and and Kowitz, um did lose her son in in the first world war and so um what's often discussed is that she you know she brings her own kind of personal uh sense of grief and pain to um to the composition and then just sort of quickly going back to um the butcher what i find so so striking about this is also how she um uses the animals faces to convey that sense of pain and maybe Bar darby can kind of point us to which, which animal that you're you're most drawn to or when you saw this or when you're really like looking at this closely how yeah. she again evoked an empathy yeah the eyes for me were really what was the most striking um i just felt like the eyes had a very piercing gaze on all the animals and on the humans too um i didn't mention it before but she also is interested in the um the way the human workers of the slaughterhouses are treated not just the animals um but the animal in the foreground on the right, I think it's the sheep. Um, that one always really tugged at my heartstrings the most, I think it's just the smallest, seemed like the most helpless being trampled. Um, and then of course the cow who's hanging, that one's also hard to see with the ribs protruding, um, definitely, oh, and the tagged ear. Um, so those were the two animals for me, but just the eyes in general, like you just, you feel for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's for me, it's always this little piglet right at the center um, with the blood kind of staining on his cheeks. Great. Well, th thanks. Okay, we'll keep moving forward. So, uh, so on this wall, you can get a sense of, um, of Carolyn's exhibition that she co-curated with, with Joy Zangi, um, Mexico and the People. And we only have one, about one week left before this exhibition closes. Um, but again, beautiful, beautiful show. Um, so on this wall, uh, you can see the Donna Ferrato photographs on, on the right, and Megan will, will tell us a bit about those. And then over here on the left are two collages by Zoe Charlton, and Ashley's going to tell us about these. And then the K Walking Stick print, um, and then a big print by Emma Amos. These two are on loan from Lafayette College Art Gallery. And then this is a portrait of Marian Anderson by uh, artist Margaret Burroughs, uh, which is on loan from, from Dr. Smith, from Dr. Smith's own personal collection. And what I like, what I feel like is, you know, again, so, so difficult um, to kind of convey through our screens, um, through the web camera right here, but is the sense of, again, like connected threads or, or ways that we can understand how one, one work it can be in dialogue with another work. Um, and on this wall, what uh, what I found was once everything, you know, was in the gallery and we had to find places for it, was finding those ways that artists, um, that the works put together do create new conversations and new dialogue. So we'll talk in a minute about Zoe Charlton's collages, but I loved seeing the collages of, of these fragmented bodies next to um, the fragmented bodies in the K walking stick work uh, next to, again, this, the, the collaged, you know, faces and, and photographs and portraits and the Emma Amos and the portraits then that repeat uh, in both the um, the Margaret Burroughs print, and then the faces that repeat um, in Donna Ferrato. And so the, I feel like this is my wall that kind of transitions from, from collaged bodies and faces um, into, into more serious portraits. 
So, um, so Ashley is going to tell us a little bit about these two collages by contemporary artist Zoe Charlton. Yeah, so as uh, Professor Egan just said, Zoe Charlton is a contemporary artist. I think she's still working out of Baltimore right now, so she's kind of close to Gettysburg, which was really cool. My first interaction with her was in the spring 2019 semester when um, the main gallery space was dedicated to her show, The Domestic. And I saw these pieces in that show and I really liked them then. So when Professor Egan offered them up for this um, exhibit, I fought for them very viciously <laughs> in class. But um, yeah, so the one on the left is Homebodies number eight. And then the one on the right is Rear number two. And they're both playing with themes of domesticity and the Black woman and how she fit into that role for so long and how she's still contextualized by this role. Um, more specifically, in Homebodies number eight, you this collage of a cookie cutter type house from the 50s with um, the young paper doll body imposed into it kind of speaks on domesticity as a whole and how a woman identifies with her role in the home and how she becomes the home and kind of the options limited outside of that. And then in Reared number two, I found that she's talking from a distinctly Black experience of the commodified woman's body. Um, that collage, the Black woman figure is taken from pornography, which speaks to even more so how the Black woman has been commodified through time. She's been commodified as a caretaker, expected to rear white children for well-to-do white families and assimilate to that role as nanny and caretaker. Um, and so having the white child swaddled in between her breasts speaks to that. Um, yeah, she also speaks about primitivism and how the Black body is still primitivized, exotified in art with the inclusion of the African mask as the face. That's kind of a recall back to Pablo, Picasso, Pablo Picasso's Lay Madame, I never say it right, but. Um, the Dame Sales to Avignon. <laughs> yes, that one, where the bodies are also exotified with the use of African masks as the face. So I think there's so much that can be taken from both of these. And just like Ryan was saying, I mean, we did this research last fall before Black Lives Matter. I think if I was writing this paper now, I would take it even a bunch more places than I did. But I think it has a lot to say about the stereotype of mammy and how the Black woman is conceptualized and treated in, in popular culture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I agree. And that I'm glad that you, you mentioned thinking about, um, yeah, thinking about more recent politics in our understanding of this too. Um, and one thing that Ashley mentioned in you know, her longer exhibition paper and then in a longer research paper too was, uh, was also um, the, how systemic racism is even tied to the rise of suburbia. And with, uh, with Zoe Charlton's allusion to, or you know, use of this model suburban home and what she did was she um, she was I think she was collecting Lionel train boxes, and um, and like and scanned and printed the homes um, like the the you know the homes as they were pictured on the cardboard boxes where you you know open up the box and you'd have this you know little playhouse to complete your whole Lionel train track uh, track set um, that that reference to the suburban home too needs, I think can be understood or can be situated within more recent dis discussions and even, even in this election cycle too um, with, you know, kind of uh, very, very contentious ways of, of trying to kind of get at suburban voters and play to their, um, their racist fears. And I think Zoe Charlton's work, especially on the left, alludes alludes to that too, um, with with the the suburban home, and with the white the little white girl figure, the paper doll. Um, that's that's 
you know, becomes the sort of hybrid figure in this in this house with the silhouetted head um, and the, the Mary Janes below. Yeah, Ashley. Something else I forgot to mention that I wrote about that I think is especially relevant now is also in weird number two is um, seeing this idealistic young white child being reared by a black mammy figure. Uh, I think Zoe Charlton is also trying to draw our attention to the opportunities that like a black child doesn't get that are the same as a white child because well, mm -hmm. A black woman is there caring for the white children's family. She usually still has a family back at home and just the inequities in general of growing up. Yeah, yeah. And um, and as, Lee, as Ashley mentioned too, we are fortunate to have had a big solo exhibition of Charlton's work in the spring of, of 2019. And um, in that um, exhibition was a huge, huge installation of this upside down blue house. And the um, and Zoe had mentioned um, her, the, her grandmother as a kind of central figure as sort of the, the inspiration for this, this body of work that she called um, the domestic because her grandmother was, um, was a domestic worker, but her grandmother was also a homeowner and owned, um, owned a home and basically had a you know homestead in Florida and the house that she had installed in the gallery which was yeah this relatively small blue house um, was her memory right of of her grandmother's house but kind of completely flipped upside down so it's speaking to I think her own um, her own identity and family history and her own family's history with with generational and systemic racism too. Okay, thanks. Keeping an eye on the time. We're going to switch back over to Darby, who's going to tell us a bit about K Walking Stick. Um, so K Walking Stick is a Native American and American artist. Um, and one of the big things that she wants to communicate is aspects of identity and how she doesn't want to be pigeonholed basically into being a Native American artist and a Native American artist only. Um, she has many more identities to her than just that. Um, her paternal side of her family is Native American, but she was raised by her mom, um, not near any of her um, father's family. So although she's genetically from um, a Native family, it wasn't part of her upbringing necessarily. But important to note is that she was actually the first Native American artist to be included um, in the uh, Jansen art history textbook. Um, so that was, she, kind of helped make her claim to fame as being one of the most well-known contemporary Native American artists. But as far as this piece specifically, um, the title is in Italian. Um, I don't know how to say it without butchering it, but it translates to a dream of the courtyard. Um, and she spent uh, several years in Italy um, as a professor and was very, very influenced by all of the art that she saw there. Um, and kind of brought that back. And that's very much part of this uh, piece, which is a um, stereograph and collagraph. Um, it's a diptych, so it's two pieces. Um, and there are two sets of legs. Um, they're ambiguous, which is part of her way of communicating just the you know, human essence of, you know, at the end of the day, we may all have differences, but humans are humans. Um, and she thinks dance is one of the most intimate things that two humans can do together. Um, so this piece is really about the beauty of just human, um, human connection and intimacy. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful piece. I actually, I don't think I mentioned this to Professor E when I was doing this. When I did this, I was in the middle of two capstones and had the coronavirus. So it was quite the time for me. Um, but I, I'm also Native American, but like, K walking stick, it wasn't something I was brought up with. It's from my dad's side of the family as well. Um, and we're estranged from him. So my great grandparents um, lived on a reservation and everything, but I don't know anything about them. I don't know what tribe it was. So just for me doing this research, research was really interesting and kind of a connection I felt. Um, but it, it, was, it was really interesting to read about her and her influences. I actually briefly got to talk to her. I emailed her, um, she emailed me back, but this was uh, near the end of her career. Um, and is very different than her landscape paintings that she did early on. But if you 
want to learn more about her, this book is from the uh, Smithsonian or the American Indian Museum. I basically bought every book there was on Kay Walking Sticks since this was right at the beginning of the pandemic and I had no libraries, but there's a lot of really interesting information out there about her. That's great. I'm so glad. Thank you for sharing that about your about your background. Um, and what a K, how is K Walking Stick in um, in uh, the uh, in your email correspondence? Um, she was pretty short and to the point. I mean, very polite, but just um, definitely I could kind of get the sense of no nonsense. This is how she felt. Um, she did this at the Experimental Printmaking Institute, and she said she had um, a lot of really good experiences there and got to meet other artists that. Um, she learned a lot from, but other than that, she was, she thought it was nice that I was doing research on her, but she was pretty short in her answers as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, thanks. And one thing too, that this, um, uh, that, that I think Darby had mentioned or that we had discussed was how, um, for, I think we talked about how reminded us of, of Matisse's The Dance. And, and again, kind of like Ashley, uh, Ashley's work, or she re she's recognizing that Zoe Charlton is sort of looking back on like French or European modernism and thinking about how how that can be updated, like what the art historical precedent is, and how to kind of critique it and move beyond it to to say something else about um, you know again to contemporary politics. I think Kay Walking Stick is appropriating or paying homage to, or making us, or at least making, you know, Darby and me think about Matisse as the dance, um, but again, pushing it, pushing it past that, that early 20th century context. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I wanna kind of, again, keeping an eye on the time, I'm gonna um, uh, jump past Emma Amo so that Megan can share with us her work on Donna Ferrato. Go ahead, Megan. Are you still here? Yeah. Um, these photos um, by Ferrato are really, really interesting. In um, 1981, she was working for Japanese Playboy and photographing um, just the glamorous New York lifestyle. And she was living with a couple, um, uh, Elizabeth and Binget Holt. Holmgren, I think. Uh, he is um, Norwegian, so it's a little bit of a difficult name. Um, but one night she was living with the couple and um, he started beating Elizabeth and she was uh, able to um, photograph it. And from that point on, she kind of got this interest in um, representing and documenting domestic violence. Um, and it was just a very interesting, all of these photos are from a series called Living with the Enemy that she turned into a book that I highly recommend anyone to read because not only are the photographs there, but there are um, interviews with a lot of the women in it and they tell a lot of interesting things. Um, for instance, the one on the left is um, a woman named Ruth and um, Frado actually made that image the cover of her book because it's so striking with the um, the both of her black eyes and you can see her nose is uh, broken. And in the interview with Ruth, um, it she says that um, my sons don't recognize me now because of what he has done to me. I'll never go back, which I think is just such a striking like realization of how heartbreaking a lot of this is. Um, but there was also this um, interesting juxtaposition with the timing and this being in the 1980s. Um, uh, there's a lot of social pressure for these women to stay with the family, especially when there are children. And so uh, Ferrato really kind of pushed for um, these photos and pushed for legislation to try to help these women. Um, and she actually got her wish in, um, in 1994, the um, Violence Against Women Act was passed. And one of the co-sponsors was actually um, Joe Biden, who is 
most uh, who is one potentially the next president and he actually has said before that her photos um, are a reason for him pushing for this legislation and I think that's really interesting that not only did um, is her work striking and really important but it also actually impacted legislation and actually helped these women. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, again, that's like such a, another important um, understanding that, that art, art can make change, right? It can make change in small ways with, you know, your choice of diet, but it can make change in, in big ways too. Um, and yeah, and, and Megan did a, um, again, wonderful job in, in, in the exhibition catalog. She even quotes, she says, um, and I've been saying this to all of the people who are coming into the gallery or through virtual visits. She said, I met Joe Biden on an Amtrak commuter train from New York to DC while he was working on the creation of the Violence Against Women Act. He told me he had my book on his bookshelf and that he had been educated by the stories in it. So again, it's really remarkable that, um, yeah, that Donna Ferrato had committed so many years to collecting these stories. And Megan, she went, um, in addition to kind of visiting battered women's shelters, she went with cops too, right? Or yeah. went on she actually spent over 6,000 hours riding along with cops. Um, and that's actually what how she got the other photo here, um, the one on the right. Um, it was one of these calls and she really focused on this idea. You can kind of see how um, the woman looks very scared and the police is kind of this overbearing presence as this kind of shadowy mm -hmm. figure. Um, and that was because um, police were the first to respond to domestic violence, but in the past, they very rarely took them seriously. Mm -hmm. um, there were very, it was very rarely that they, um, that the men were arrested, even when it was obvious that the women's lives were in danger. Um, and so there were a lot of pushes for um, protections. And eventually, um, in 1984, um, the U.S. Attorney General's Task Force on family violence recommended that they um, that the there be a mandatory um, arrest for this. And um, in 19, 1986, six states passed laws requiring um, the offenders to be arrested. And then year, in the years following, these mandatory arrest policies um, really limited that discretion that police officers had that really allowed them to dismiss domestic violence originally as kind of a civil matter and something of the home. It really made them it more like seen. Yeah, and I like too how you mentioned um, uh, the, the photograph on the right, that because to me it feels, or just that juxtaposition between the big menacing kind of shadowy figure of the police officer with the woman kind of sandwiched um, behind him, kind of cowering behind him with her hands up trying to, to explain. And we see a little bit of his um, of his face in, in the mirror, but it's a very, very menacing, strange, kind of interestingly composed photograph that to me, again, feels critical, right? Critical of the police and the police's handling or the police's response to, um, to issues of domestic violence and, and sexual assault. Um, we are, we have about, I don't, again, I don't want to take up too much of your beautiful Saturday afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just take uh, a minute to kind of just show you a few more works from the show. And then I'd love to open it up for, for more questions for our student curators and comments. This is the, the print um, by Margaret Burroughs. And again, important black artist from Dr. Deborah Smith's collection of Marian Anderson. And of course, this was um, made in 1964. And Marian Anderson was um, a classical vocalist who sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 after the Daughters of American Revolution, um, who uh, decided that she was not allowed to perform in the Constitution Hall in 1939. So Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR invited her to sing um, instead um, on the mall. And then she was invited to sing uh, during the March on Washington in 1963. And so with this print made in 1964, uh, to me, it's sort of in direct response to, uh, to again, Marian Anderson as this, um, as this civil rights um, hero, really. 
Uh, she also served, I want to mention too, she served on the Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee and was a goodwill ambassador for the US Department of State. And Margaret Burroughs is also remarkable in that she was an activist, she was a poet, she was the co-founder of the Disabled Museum, which was the first museum dedicated to African American art and culture. And, um, and one of our student curators, um, uh, Mars Smeltzer found uh, kind of used in her catalog essay and on the wall label um, mentioned or included a couple stanzas from a, a poem called Homage to the Black Madonnas that Margaret Burroughs wrote in 1968. And I always think it's really lovely to mention. I'm going to read it to you now. She wrote, Magnificent Black women, the poets and singers have been remiss, have sung too few poems and songs of you, and the image makers have not recorded your beauty. And um, I think Mars again did a really wonderful job of, of articulating that both, you know, that both Margaret Burroughs and Marian Anderson need to be, we need to pay homage to them as, as Black Madonnas. Um, and then other works that we didn't get a chance to, to talk about, um, a contemporary artist named Jessica, Jessica Houston, who gave a talk earlier, a virtual talk earlier this semester, um, a big print by Kara Walker in our collection, a few Gorilla Girls posters. And I do want to mention on um, November 12th, 4 p.m., we are hosting another virtual lecture by Jerry Philogene. And I think Dr. Philogene will uh, talk a bit about this Kara Walker print, um, as well as um, uh, these works by Judy Chicago. And we have three works by Judy Chicago from her birth project series. Um, as well as, let me jump ahead, this film by Anna Mendieta that, that I mentioned is on loan. So um, yeah, so a couple minutes left. I will open it up and I'm happy again to kind of walk us through a little bit. I might go back and show you again this other work by in um, on loan from Dr. Smith, um, this beautiful print by Elizabeth Catlett of Harriet Tubman from 1975. So thoughts or questions? Well, I'll just mention while everyone is formulating any other thoughts that congratulations to everyone and especially to you, uh, Dr. Egan, Shannon. Um, and uh, the catalog is really very well done. And um, I am glad that I had the opportunity to join in this afternoon. Um, certainly would have been on campus when um, the regular order of things had taken place and hope that I'll still make a quick um, trip up before um, the exhibition comes down. So uh, great work, everyone. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm happy once we uh, have opportunities again to um, see what else I can contribute um, for your next great idea, <laughs> set of ideas for, um, for some of your courses. That sounds wonderful. That sounds great. Yeah, thanks so much, Shannon, and congratulations to all the students. It's it's wonderful to see the gallery in the virtual space, especially for those of us who would have loved to come and see it, but but can't. Um, it really looks beautiful. So, congrats. Thanks. Thank you all. So um, yeah, so thanks thanks again to the students for taking their time. This wasn't a, wasn't a requirement. This is just you know them, them volunteering their time to speak with you. So I really really appreciate that. Um, again, if you if you are free, I invite you to come back tune in on November twelfth at four p.m. And um, yeah, and thanks everyone. It's lovely to see you. And take I care. can't wait to tell my kids that I actually did family weekend again. Um. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Emily, I'm just going to shout out. Uh, you have, I just saw the chat. Uh, yeah, that you have another impression of the same print. We do. And I, I, set, I posted the link in the chat. And um, our copy at the National Gallery is number 14. And the work that's in the show um, at Gettysburg is 15. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Which, which work? Oh, the, which the catwalk one is that? Piece. 
Oh, the K-walking, K-walking stick. stick. Oh, okay, great. great, great. Yep. It, the image stick. flashed okay. on screen, and I thought, that looks so familiar. Why is that so familiar? And I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I also just want to mention too, I just had um, a a civil war and gender class in the gallery um, the other day and taught by um, Professor Jim Downs, who's new, um, new professor at Gettysburg College. And we spent a lot of time, he had so many insightful things to, to say about this print by Elizabeth Catlett about Harriet. Um, about Harriet Tubman. And again, like situating it um, in, you know, the 1970s, we all know who Harriet Tubman is, but this is a moment too, when there was a kind of concerted effort to, you know, to teach Black history. And then also, as we were talking, um, Harriet Tubman, kind of as we we know from the, like the recent movie, she was really kind of short, but here she seems so huge and monumental and really tall. And some of the students commented on her kind of more masculine appearance. And I thought that was, that was interesting as well as looking at this, um, this black man um, looking, looking away, like looking in the opposite direction from where she's pointed. And again, kind of um, thinking about and speaking to um, uh, the, the issue of, of some of the black men who did not follow, who did, did not want them uh, to be led by her. Um, so I, again, just kind of as a conclusion, a way to think about, again, these ongoing conversations that the students really kind of set the stage for, um, for I think, really, really important conversations that, that are continue to be ongoing, despite the, the challenges of, of where we are um, in time and space, that, that they're, they've done a phenomenal job and their work continues to have an impact. So, so thanks, thanks everybody. So Shannon, I know yeah, you're, well I, you were winding up, but I'll just, just came to say one thing. So this is, yeah. so Elizabeth Catlett did other, this may be her third iteration. It certainly it's the second mm-hmm. because she did a, she did a Harriet as um, part of a larger series on women in the forties. And so they're slightly different but this is one that she did again, as you mentioned in the seventies, which undoubtedly does have significance. Um, I spent four years, I knew the, um, the uh, art dealer, um, she was still alive and um, he had access a couple times a year to her vault in New York. Cause she of course lived in Cuernavaca, Mexico for many years. And every year he would call me and he would say, I'm on my way to New York. I'm going to see if she'll let me um, <laughs> get you a Harriet. And so lo and behold, after four years, one time I got this call and said, I don't know why she changed her mind this time, but she said, um, you could, you, I could bring you a Harriet. So um, that was like one of my best, um, best experiences. <laughs> uh, but, but actually it's interesting to look back because she did do um, some, Harriet about 30 years earlier. Oh, good, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks again. Yeah, feel free to stick around for a minute or two um, if you wanna chat, but I'd love to, to see you all in person sometime soon. So thanks for being here.